Oliver from Rugby League, in my opinion, here today. But a very special guest on his first podcast interview. Um, he's here. He's loud and clear. I can see him on my computer screen. He's done a good job to jump on for his first interview. It is Glenn Nissen. How are you today, Glenn? Yeah, great, Oliver. Uh, thanks for having me, mate. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, you had a, a pretty good career, I think I'd say, um, out west uh, with the Panthers and the Bulldogs. We'll get into that in a bit, but the first thing I want to ask you about is uh, coming through the ranks um, as you were coming up as a footballer, tell us a bit about who you played for um, and how you were able to get your start. Because if what I believe is true, you actually had a, a quick stint in England before you made your uh, debut over here, which is usually which is the complete opposite of what usually happens. So I'm interested to know sure. a bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Mate, I started off as a, a young fella playing for the Warragamba Wombats. Mum and Dad grew up... Um, we grew up out the, down at the dam. And uh, when I went to high school, um, year seven, I started went to St Dominic's at Kingswood. Yep. Um, started playing with St Dominic's, the rugby league club, on a, on a weekend. Um, and our side struggled a bit. Um, we were the age group under Grell Alexander's St Dominic's side. Right. And they were just guns, like... They had Johnny Cartwright and Brandy, and they went through. They were going through undefeated for years and years and years. My side was getting flogged like fifty nil and stuff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I was with the Doms, and um, I tried. I tried out for under fourteens. Used to be Harold Matthews. Yeah. SG Ball was under sixteens. Uh, I didn't make Harold Matthews. I made the SG Ball, but wasn't in the starting side. I'd probably only get five minutes, you know, each week. Didn't really. So I didn't, I made it, but I didn't kind of make it. Yeah. Uh, and then I decided to have a year off when I was 17 where I didn't play footy at all. And I just dedicated that year to just training my ass off, basically, um, getting as fit as I could. Um, and then I actually made the starting side for the under 18s, uh, which was Jersey Fleet back then. And out of we made the grand final that year. We played Balmain. We got beat in the grand final, and I got graded in '84 from the Jersey flag side of Penrith. And halfway through the '84, uh, and in '84 there was uh, it was third grade. It wasn't 23s or 21s. It was uh, first grade, reserve grade, third grade, which was open age. So you had. Old fellas that right. played a whole career coming through, coming back, and young fellas going up, and it was tough. Like I and I probably didn't quite believe that I belonged there, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but um, and then it went back to under twenty threes or twenty ones uh, in eighty five, if I if I'm right. Um, so you know that was a, a tough initi- initiation. Um, eighty four was when Brandy Alexander started, got graded with Penrith too. But he was just a natural talent, straight to first grade, you know what I mean? Where I was sort of looking around and looking at players going, well, I don't know if I belong here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, so, well, a couple of things that I'm interested in. First of all, you talk about losing a grand final to Balmain. I guess you'd get your revenge on them eventually, but we'll, we'll oh, bring absolutely. that up a bit later. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm interested in that year you took off to train because not a lot of players are able to take a full year off and then come back successfully. Um, I have interviewed a couple of players in the past. One in particular, I know that's still currently playing. He's over in the UK now. Took took a year off and said he probably wasn't quite at the at the level he was um, to when he, um, he he took time off. But how did that benefit you? Do you think you were able to have a better career? because of that year off? Because as you said, you were training your ass off for that year and you ended up playing Jersey Flag the next season. So yeah, what impact I, did that have? Yeah, I my probably the strength of my game was my fitness. Um, although I, I, I was fast, I had speed, but I was I was ultra fit. I just loved training, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and, when, and when I didn't make that side in the under-16s, I knew Flag was coming up in the uh, 18s. Yeah. I just went, I'm just going to dedicate a year to just to training my ass off, <laughs> swimming and running and just, get, just started doing weights and stuff, you know. 
because uh, I was I was pretty tiny. I wasn't a big guy. Yeah. Um, and then and then that sort of paid off. Um, and when I got graded into third grade, sort of, you know, I still kind of didn't think I belonged there really. Um, and then in 80, 85, I remember one of the first games of the year, I got put in reserve grade and yeah. we were playing at Jubilee Oval against the Dragons. And their reserve grade side had guys like uh, Harry, and not Harry Bartha, um Barry Beath, I think his name was, and yeah. Robert Stone, and mate, big guys that have played first grade for years. And yeah. mate, I just, I was out there like a, a piece of cardboard, just yeah. looking at these blanks, and they flogged us. <laughs> they flogged us by fifty points, and I went. It was eighty five had gone to twenty three, so I went back in the twenty threes, and like it took me a whole year of just playing and sort of yeah. getting, getting my head around it all, you know what I mean? Um, and then at the end of 85, uh, there was a halfback playing first grade for Penrith called Mickey Davis. Um, love Mickey. Um, at the end of 84, we went on end of season trip. And back in those days, we used to go to Bali and yeah. I was the youngest, youngest guy on the trip. And I roomed with Mickey Davis and Mickey Davis played a lot of first grade at Parramatta. Yeah. And he, he came to Penrith and he was the half first grade half back at Penrith and Brandy turned up. So he came back down to reserve grade and uh, Gray Alexander was the first grade half back. But on the end of season trip, we were uh, boarding together and we got on really well. And he said to me, and he said, he'd been playing a couple of off-seasons in England. Yeah. And he said to me, mate, he played he, he played for Fulham, yeah. uh, which is now the London Broncos. And he said, mate, they're looking for a young outside back. You want to come back with me next year? Um, and that was at the end of 85. Yeah. So he organised all of that and um, took me to England uh, after the 85 season. And... Over there, I played probably 20, 22 first grade games for Fulham. Uh, missed the off season in 85, 86, and came back. And that just done my confidence a whole lot of good. Yeah. Uh, I was playing with Mick first grade over in English, although we weren't in the Premier Division, we were in Second Division. So we were travelling around to um, Whitehaven and Barrow and all these different places. Yeah. Um, and that just gave me confidence. You know, I came back, you know, starting to think, thinking that I sort of belonged where I was, yep. you know what I mean? And, and Mick, Mick was a big, a big influence on me in, in teaching me confidence, you know, and, and saying, mate, even if you're not confident, look confident. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, it's funny, like even in, in just uh, living life, if, you know, if you're trying to get in somewhere, if you just – Walk straight up, look the guy in the eye, and just keep walking. <laughs> you know, if you and you know, I just let you go past. Yeah, that's all this. You know, yeah. So Mick was a big influence on me, and then I came back and um, in '86, Penrith, Penrith twenty uh, threes made the grand final. Yeah, uh, I, I got my first starting first grade uh, in '86. I think it was a, uh, I think it was against Bowman again, and I think it was a. I don't know if it was MK Cup then or National Panasonic Cup. Right, yeah, yeah, midweek cup. I, I just went on went on a reserve um, in at the end of the game and and Gary Jack was the was the fullback for um yeah. in, you know, the Australian fullback. Yeah. And uh, so it's just sort of I could, and then in eighty seven uh, I played probably five or six first grade games, but we had a really good reserve grade side of Penrith coached by Graham Murray and yeah. Uh, he's passed away now. Uh, beautiful guy, amazing coach, and uh, we our reserve grade pack in 80, 87 um, had uh, a young Tony Butterfield and a, a seasoned um, Daryl Broman. Yeah, you know we had Mark Geyer in the second row with uh, Warren Fenton, so we had Warren Fenton and, and Big D and, and Butts and Mark Geyer, and that was our yeah. reserve grade. Pack, yeah. you know what I mean, and, and we won the comp. Yeah, um, with both Gentleman, Graham Murray. Manly, Manly, wasn't it? I think I've seen yeah, it. Man. Yeah, true. True. So, you know, it, it, it took me sort of 
84, 85, 86, 87, just to feel like I belonged where, what I was doing. And I was, I was not, not meant to be there, but I could, I could mix it, <laughs> if yep. you know what I mean. Yeah. So where, where you, you look at guys that are, you know, ultra talented, like, like Brandy was, you know, just straight in first grade at, at 17, 18 years old, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, it took me a while to, to get there. Yeah, so you talk about spending 84, 85, 86, 87, you know, trying to get a, a, lo- a lot of it was confidence that you could hang with these guys at the very least to yep. the very next year winning a Winfield Cup with Canterbury-Bankstown. Uh, first of all, I want to ask about the move to uh, Canterbury-Bankstown. Uh, was Gus Gould a big part of, of of making that move happen? Yeah, he was. I... Um... After we won the grand final in 87 with the reserve grade, I was actually signed with Penrith um, for 88. Yep. Um, with a like a clause in my contract saying if, if I'd played so many first rate games, they'd renegotiate the contract. Yeah. Um, and gee, they, I went in with my manager, which is a guy named Paul Gibson. He used to be the uh, Labour MP for Londonderry, beautiful guy. His son, Greg. Gibson played with us at Penrith and then went on to play at Manly. Yeah. Um, we we went in and had a meeting with Penrith and they um, said they would give me, I think I think it was about 25000 for the next year. And when we went in to sign it, it was only 10. All right. And we just went, we just went, what? Like <laughs> last week we agreed on this amount yeah. and they pretty well said take it or leave it. So uh, because of that, um, I was I was a free agent basically, and Gus Gus had coached me in under twelves or thirteens at St Dominic's right. when Gus was when Gus was the youngest captain of Penrith. When he was 20, 21, yeah. when he was playing at Penrith, he coached me in under twelves, thirteens at St Dominic's. So yeah, um, and Gus was a reserve grade coach at Canterbury in eighty seven when our side won the yeah. comp. So he was aware of me. He, you know, coached me as a young fella. Um, I almost went to the Roosters. Um, and then Gus, Gus and Bulldogs got in touch with me. And, yeah, actually, they, actually, they were a bit – the Roosters actually offered a bit more. But with my link with Gus, yeah. um, I love the blue and white because um, Warra Gamble were blue and white, the Wombats. St. Dominic's were blue and white. Yeah. And, still and are. the Bulldogs were blue and white. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so but Gus was a big influence on that. And, and when you looked at the Bulldog side at that time, yeah. You know, they were they were full of start of origin internationals, you know, folks, Langmack, Glasby, Tunks, Dunn, Thomas, Bugden, you know what I mean? They were just Andrew Farrow, Terry Lamb, Steve Mortimer. It, it was just an opportunity to to uh, big to to toss up, you know. So yeah, yeah I went to the Bulldogs. <laughs> yeah, but, well, they seem to be in a bit of an odd situation, funnily enough, heading into '88 because they'd win the comp '80. Um, they were still a pretty consistent side throughout pa- Parramatta's three comps, and then they'd win in '84 back it up in 85, then 86, still make the grand final, but obviously lose to Parramatta. Then I believe yeah. in 87, they missed the the top five entirely, as did Parramatta. So right, yeah. I, I guess for them, it would have been that first stage of, um, in a while of... Uh, kind of what, rebuilding. What you know? Yeah. They um, had a new coach with Gus coming yeah. in because Warren Ryan left. Um, yeah. But, um, but I, I remember... I remember my first training session. It was at um, oh, not Condal Park, where Terry Lamb lived, Bass Hill or something. Right. We, on, yeah. we were at, at some obscure oval, and I turned up for my first session, and Gus just pulled me aside on the sideline, and said, "Nisso, have a look out there, you know." And I'm watching Terry Lamb and Steve Mortimer and yeah. Dave Gillespie and Steve Fakes run around. He said, "Mate, you're going to enjoy the ride," <laughs> you know. And it was so it was just so true. Um, like, you know, uh, I couldn't tie their bootlaces up, you know? Right. And, and, and a young guy might, like me running around 
amongst those players, like, oh, who's not going to look good? <laughs> like, seriously, you know, they made, it, they made it possible. Well, of course, you blokes would end up going on to win the grand final in 88. Um, it, it's obviously a good feeling, but tell us a little bit about how it felt to win the 1988 Winfield Cup. I guess how you're feeling heading into the game, um, how you perceived the game, and your reaction and how you felt afterwards. Mate, I, I still pinch myself thinking about it, honestly. Yeah. Um, but we, we as a side went in very confident. Um, you know, for the season, like the season proper, I, I don't know the exact weeks, but out of the – if there was 22 rounds, we led the competition for 17 out of the 22 rounds, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Gus, Gus was an amazing coach. Um, he, an amazing, um, like it's the best. You want to play for him. Yeah. He's a player's coach. He's he the way he talks and his motivation is just crazy. And I remember in many games during the year we'd be at training and he'd say, he'd say, mate, this is like a bit for set moves. Hey, we're going to do this, this, and this. Like he'd study the other side and he'll say, mate, they find their weaknesses. And if when we do this, this, we'll score. Yeah. And we and we would. You would, yeah. And, and, and it blew me away. Yeah. And he, the try in the grand final that um, I had a, a, a part in where Michael Hagen scored um, in the first half, at the end of the first half, at, we, we trained for that. Yeah. Like that specific move, like Gus had said to us, mate, we're just going to be patient. We're going to just kick the This What he said is we're going to kick the ball down the other end. If they're good enough to get it back to our end, we're just going to kick it back. Respect that. Kick it back down to them. And he said, we're just going to wait till, be patient, and wait till we get the ball back near the halfway line. Yeah, and he said on the first tackle, the very first tackle, we're just going to spread it straight out. And he said they won't be ready. Yeah, your score. Well, your score. That was his. That was yeah. his words. And and we did that. We just kicked it. Guy got it back. We kicked it back down. Got it back. Kicked it down. And eventually we got the ball back. I think it was 10, 10 meters on our side of our halfway. Yeah. Jason Outson brought it back, and you know what? Watch the replays. It just goes four quick hands, bang, 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 and we got him. And he told us we'd get him. Yeah, you know. And it just when your coach is like that, it just gives us confidence. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, we went into that game confident. And you know, I think whether a lot of people say you know, Elliot Hanley got that cost bow main in the game, but mm. you know what? I don't think he'd done much for the half hour he was on. Um, he was belted from pillar to post. And I don't think it would have made any difference. I don't think – I got no doubt we'll, we weren't going to lose that game. Yeah. You know. And the feeling of winning it was, you know, as you just can't describe it. Um, and I remember Gus saying too before the game, you know, if, if you don't win this game – Mate, no one's going to give a hoot. You know, no one's going to remember who comes second. Yeah. And he said, but you, we kick their ass and you win it. People will be talking about it 30 years' time. And here I am, <laughs> what, 33, 33 years. You know, that's a long time. Yeah. And, and people still bring it up. And it's just crazy. It's really, really crazy. Oh, I, I honestly pinch myself that I was a part of that. Yeah, definitely. Well, you also look at, I guess, generations coming through, right? And young fans who are coming through as rugby league fans, they'll look up the Canterbury, Bankstown Bulldogs, whatever. A Wikipedia page will come up, but the first thing that comes up is how many premierships they've won and in what years. So that 88 grand final is always going to be there. It's always going to be a part sure. of that that history. Of course, if you if you lose the grand final, that's that's not going to be there. They, they don't usually tell you who... Um, who came second best unless you actually uh, do a bit of research into it. Um, uh, 
one more question on the grand final. You did bring up, obviously, how early in your career Val may beat you when you're at, at Penrith in a grand final coming through the ranks. For you personally, was it just a bit of a bit of icing on the cake that it was against Balmain that that oh, you won the big no, one? Again? You know what? It never crossed my mind, to be honest. Oh, it really? never crossed my mind that that they'd beat us in the Jersey Flag Grand Final, and here we were again. And um, I, I think just just where I was, and the people that were around me, and the, the squad we had, and the club we had, and you know the administrators, the trainers, you know the support we had. It was like clockwork. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, we, we had a good year with injuries. We didn't have a lot of injuries that year. And, um, you know, that all, that all, it, it takes a lot of luck to win a grand final. Yeah. Although, although it's not luck, you got to have a lot of things go your way, you know. Um, and it all just fell in place for us that year. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just great. And then after the grand final, you'll know about that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, good little story. Um, like, imagine the, 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 the night at Belmore that night, you know, you couldn't get through the street, couldn't yeah. get in the club. Um, that rest of the week, we had a sponsor. Like, we'd be meeting at a club or a pub or a function yeah. every day, and, and they'd be – the spread would be on, you know what I mean? Party, yeah. party, party. Yeah. And then the week, the weekend after, the next Friday, we flew as a team to Auckland. Right. And the club had organised uh, a match for us. And we were playing an Auckland rep side the week after the grand final. Yeah. For a $20,000 winner take all. Yeah, right. So, so we've like, partied every day, every night, flown to Auckland, Drinking on the plane, like went to bed, like we'll drink in the morning of the game. Yeah. Having shots of, of this game. And we've gone out and they just smacked us. <laughs> 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 and and like they were in front with like five minutes to go. This like big Aucklanders just belting us. And um Paul Langmack or or one of the strikes or someone did a little in and away, and, and we scored, and we won the 20,000. Oh, right. Couldn't believe it. And then we flown that night to Hawaii for another 10 days. And the clubs wow. and bull, bullfrogs, like, every day we're meeting at a bar or a club, and bullfrogs just putting that 20,000 on the bar. And it was like, <laughs> by day eight, I was – I felt like I had alcoholic poisoning. I was just laying in my bed in my hotel room. I just yeah. couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> Couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, but crazy. Anyway, oh, yeah. they wouldn't wouldn't happen these days. But the, that's no, what the what it was like back then. Well, def- definitely to a much lesser extent. At least they wouldn't be going to Auckland the next week to play a um no to play a rep no, team. That that's for sure. Itself. Yeah. Uh, well, eighty nine to nineteen ninety one. Uh, you were still at Canterbury for those three years. Uh, obviously, you blokes wouldn't win another comp. Uh, yeah. Take t- sort of summarize those just those three years for me, sort of how they went for you and, and what changes you saw, you saw at the club. Because obviously, Gus had ended up leaving at the end of '89, I believe it was. Um, yeah, and he was actually signed for 1992. Yeah, right. Um, and that was a big. Well, Chris Hansen came back from England, who was obviously Peter Moore's son-in-law. So I think. Um, that that was always in the plans to get rid of Gus, right? Uh, and, and when when it did happen, a lot of us were, you know, we're, we weren't happy that. Yeah. Well, no, I wasn't happy that Gus was gone because we, you know, we had a really good relationship with him. Um, so it was a big change when so Gus left sort of halfway through after Christmas, like it all happened yeah. over the Chrissy break. Um, so we, we were sort of a bit of a shock. Um, and then we, in 89, we, we kind of struggled, but we had a game where, you know, we just fell short by probably a game. Yeah. And then it was the next year Chris Anderson came. Um, and then a lot of our players at the end of 1990, I think, 
West came in and just took Langers and um, oh, there was a few of them that went. Joey Thomas went. Um, so I sort of took a bit of the nucleus. So the club was sort of kind of rebuilding again. Yeah. Because they, they'd lost the, you know, four or five of, of the mainstay of, of the team, you know. Um, yeah, so 90 and 91 were, yeah, weren't the best years for the Bulldogs. No. Um, I think we almost made the semis in 91, but we missed out. Against West, was a playoff. It? playoff against West, fifth or sixth, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, playoff at West at, at uh, Parramatta. Um, yeah, and then I was kind of on the outer then uh, by the end of 91. And um, I was looking for a club and, and Gus gave me a lifeline to go back to Penrith. And and that was crazy in itself because Penrith won the comp in 91. Yeah. So I was going back to a, a, premier, a premiership winning top side. Yeah, which had Grell Alexander, Brad Fittler, Mark Guyer, Cardi, Peter Tunks had gone over there, Brandon Lee had gone back there. Um, you know, it was a an amazing side in itself as well. You know, yeah. Well, you you both didn't obviously win the comp in nineteen ninety two, but it must have been something special. You know, finishing your career, not only to be going back to Penrith. But to be coached by the bloke who coached you when you were in the under thirteens, and the bloke who obviously co- coached you to a, a Winfield Cup in nineteen eighty eight, plus some of the names you named there were at Penrith when you were when you made your debut for the club. So it, in a way, it's sort of a nice nice send off to not only be at your be at your, your original club, but to also be playing for the coach who you won a premiership under. Was there any? Uh, sort of feeling of that or did that play into your decision um, at all in the end when you did uh, give the game away that it was you know it was the right the right sort of send off the right place for you to be under the right coach or yeah I, what was I, that like? I, it wasn't my plan to finish at the end of 92 uh, I had a lot of injuries yeah um, mate we Penrith Penrith were on the verge after they won the 91 grand final of doing a Melbourne, what yeah. Melbourne are like now. Yeah. Um, they could have won multiple competitions in those following years, but mate, what really took the shine off everything and, and there was dramas all over the place was yeah. when Ben Alexander died. Yeah. That that ripped the heart out of the club. Yeah. And um, like from that and what went come what come out of that. You know, um, MG went to Western. He went to Western Reds. Brandy went to Auckland. Yeah. Freddie went to Roosters. You know, it just split the club. You know, um, for different reasons. So it was uh, that was um, tragic for yeah. Penrith that year. Um, and then I got I got a few bad injuries, um, knee problems, and ankle problems and um, I had a lot of surgery there for a couple of years. Um, I actually um, didn't get a con like I, I just finished 92 and I had one year contract in 92 and I had to have a surgery on my knee and my ankle and full reconstructions and yeah. I sat out uh, 93 um, and then I was going to, I tried to make a comeback in 94 when Roy Simmons was the coach. Right. And I started playing, got my injuries right, started playing in the A grade with Lower Blue Mountains. Right. And um, Royce and Penrith actually signed me in 94 before the June deadline. And in the last game, to get some fitness, I just did my ankle again in, in the last game before I was going back to the club. And, yeah, that was curtains. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it was it was. It was nice to finish up at Penrith. Yeah, you know, like you say, with Gus and and players that I'd sort of played with, you know, before I went to the Bulldogs and stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, I washed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's take a quick look at the game today uh, before we finish up. You've obviously spoken about Penrith, how you, you love the club, and um, obviously your junior days there, and then your season in '92 when you went back. They're not looking too bad aside these days. Uh, made the grand final last year, ended up 
just short against Melbourne. Now, currently, there are a few injuries, but I think for pretty much every player that's injured, they're expected back before finals time. So yep. theoretically, they should be full strength, all guns blazing, heading into the final series. Um, what chance do you give them of uh, taking it out? Melbourne are obviously an amazing yep. club yep, as true. well. But Mate, they're going to be hard happen? to beat. Yeah, they're going to be hard to beat the Panthers for sure if they're full strength. And and mate, one of the like it's probably probably ironic now that you know I, I think eighty five ninety percent of the Panthers now are local juniors. Yeah. Um, and you know I, I'm not saying it's I know Gus hasn't been there for a few years, but he had the you know his famous five year plan back yeah. at Penrith, and uh, I think that that's a you know a bit of fruition from. From that, from what yeah. he did there, oh, um, which has been great, great for the Panthers. Um, yeah, I hope they go on, go on all the way this year. And, uh, and Gus is going back to Canterbury, so hopefully we can get something <laughs> going there. They're certainly buying well, but yeah, yeah, no, I think Penrith will be really hard to beat if they're at full strength. Yeah, and do you think uh, you talk about sort of Penrith having the opportunity? back in the day after 91 to do a bit of a Melbourne, as you said, and um, go on a run where they, they win a few premierships. They've locked up Cleary long-term. They've locked up Fisher-Harris long-term, Jerome Luai long-term. Uh, Isaiah Yo, I think, just re up for a couple of years as well. At, at least their main pieces are, are there. Their main pieces are going to be there for at least the next two years. Could you yep. potentially see this Penrith side maybe not going on a, on a dynasty or anything, but at least yeah, win, yeah. winning a couple of comps maybe in the next five years? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely can see that for sure. You know, they got some good juniors coming through, and um, mate, and you know what? Like the confidence you get from winning a comp, you know, and and then the, then the new fellas coming through, the young fellas that they've got, like like I did back in. You know, the start of 88, you know, you're yeah. going out on the training paddock with these guys that have won comps and it just gives you confidence to be, you know, they make you look good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're good players, you know. They've done it. They've been there, you know. And you got Cleary and who's the 5'8"? Lula, Lula. Lula, was it? Yeah, Lula. Yeah, Lula. Lula. Like they're playing State of Origin now. The, yeah. the confidence that they'll take back to Penrith, you know, and the rest of the players being around them and Isaiah Yo, you know, it, it just pays dividends. Yeah. For sure. Definitely. So the last question I want to ask you before we go, still sticking to today, you bring up Gus Gould heading back to Canary Bankstown. Uh, you said that it looks like they've signed good for next year. Okay, we've had a look at Penrith maybe for the next five years. They might win a couple of comps. Um, Canterbury for about five years now have been right down towards the bottom of the ladder. Do you see Gus getting them back up to, I'd say, at least a top eight side uh, that they were for the at least the late so 90s long. to, to yeah. the mid-2010s? Do you see him get, getting them back up to that level? Mate, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I see him getting them in the top four. Like, Gus isn't going to go there and, and, and put the bar at, hey, let's make the top eight. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's going to put the bar up and, you yeah. know, like school kids, the higher you put the bar up, the higher you, you strive to get, you know. So I definitely see that. I reckon if they got the block of cheese, they would they'd be winning the comp next year. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, he's staying in Melbourne. The latest I've heard. Oh, I just God. think he would have been the, uh, the the cherry on top to, for their signings. Right. You know, with the the four or five good signings they've got, but uh, maybe not to be. But yeah, I I definitely see Gus being a bit of a saviour there over the next couple of years for sure. Well, who knows? There could be a story in a couple of year to- years' time heading into a grand final. Penner versus Canterbury Bankstown, Gus Gould against against his old club. Who knows? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Glenn, uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today, uh, telling us your story and having a bit of a chat. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. And I just want to thank everyone else out there for tuning in and listening or watching if you have. And um, thank you for doing so. And we'll see you guys next time. Pleasure, Oliver. Thanks, mate.